Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session of the Probabilistic Machine Learning Reading Group. Tonight, we will be covering chapter 19, which is learning with fewer labeled examples. And Fernando Fernandez will be presenting. So um, whenever you're ready, Fernando, um, go for it. I'm ready. Thanks a lot for, for this invitation, Pierre. Um, 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 I'm going to share my screen, okay? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, so, as you said, my name is Fernando Fernandez. I came here to present chapter 19 of the Kevin Murphy's new book. Uh, by the way, it's raining a lot here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. So I don't know if you guys are hearing to the thunders. <laughs> so basically, if my connection drops, uh, you already know the cause. Uh, this chapter, at least from my point of view, uh, is very, very dense with uh, a long agenda, which covers uh, these subtopics, data augmentation, transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, active learning, meta-learning, and few-shot learning. Here, I have grouped these two topics because uh, I think few-shot learning is kind of consequence of meta-learning uh, in the way it's presented in the book, and weekly supervised learning. Okay, uh, uh, a, a very fast introduction to, uh, to this topic. Uh, very often we are given a large amount of unlabeled data and only very few labeled data points. On the other hand, uh, machine learning models have a large number of parameters which given only a few labeled data points to be trained in the traditional supervised supervised learning framework, this can lead, lead to overfitting. So basically the idea here of this chapter is go beyond the traditional regularization techniques, such as dropout, uh, et cetera, which are presented before in the book. Uh, so starting with data augmentation, uh, the first, a uh, topic within data augmentation presented in this chapter is fine tuning. So basically, uh, we can think of uh, data augmentation as a way to signif significantly improve the performance, predictive accuracy, robustness, etc. And at this first, uh, this might seem like we are getting something for nothing as the author says. And since we have not provided additional data, uh, the, the data augmentation mechanism can be viewed as a way to algorith algorithmically inject prior knowledge. So basically, if we first consider the empirical risk minimization, which is treated uh, in, in, the, in the previous chapter of the book, which is basically uh, uh, the integral of the, the, the loss function times the, the, the joint probability of X and Y. Uh, if we approximate this joint probability by the empirical distribution given by the sum of the delta Dirac function X minus Xn, Xn, the nth, uh, observation of the X variable and uh, the delta Dirac Y minus Y N. In this case, the nth uh, observation of the Y variable. We can think of data augmentation as replacing the empirical distribution with the following algorithm algorithmically smoothed distribution. Uh, in this case, the conditional uh, distribution of X and Y conditional to A, uh, 
and A is the data, data augmentation algorithm, which generates us, uh, a sample X from a training point X and such that the label semantics is not changed. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the author points out uh, as a theoretical justification, uh, actually we are doing a Visma risk minimization since we are minimizing the risk in the vicinity in the neighborhood of each training point X. And there is a wide range of techniques uh, that can be applied to generate these synthetic uh, labeled data points. Uh, so for example, we've, uh, we start with uh, uh, a butterfly image. Uh, and from, from this original image, we can detexturize this image. We can decolorize this image. Eventually we can enhance the edges or salient the, the edge map, or basically we can flip or rotate the image. So the main idea when we do this uh, data augmentation procedure, uh, aiming this FISNA risk minimization is to suppress specific features which uh, do not contribute for uh, the knowledge extraction uh, from the observations. Uh, the, the other objective we can see is uh, to detect the invariances uh, which may be present or desirable to, to be extracted uh, in the um, case of- Fernandez. May I have a question? Are we on the slide number one? Because I can only see slide number one. Uh, yeah, I don't know if uh, you're going through the slides, but it's only slide number one that's showing. Uh, strange, because I'm, I'm passing through this, the, the slides and uh, basically <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what is happening because I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the screen maybe what what i get is not what you see i'll i'll, I'll you change the way uh there we go now we can see the, uh, yeah now we can okay. see slide number five okay uh i, I was here sorry <laughs> okay <laughs> but but for, for, uh, do, do you want to uh to, to these previous slides to be repeated or uh, and you know, it, is it okay for you? Um, I think it's fine since the other slides uh, um, didn't have too much content, right? Okay. Well, maybe, well, basically... maybe, maybe you could go back here, start with slide number five. Okay. So as I was saying before, basically we, uh, we can consider the empirical risk minimization and here we, we begin with theoretical justification. Uh, as I said, we can approximate the empirical distribution, uh, the joint uh, distribution by the empirical distribution, the joint empirical distribution in terms of Delta Dirac. Uh, and then the main idea of data augmentation is replacing this empirical distribution uh, with the following algorithmically smooth distribution where A, is the data augmentation algorithm, right? And here I was explaining uh, in, in graphical terms, uh, what kind of data augmentation uh, can be done, right? So for example, if we think of an image uh, and we have an, the, the original image, we can detexturize this image, decolorize this image, eventually edge enhance or make a silent edge map or basically flip or rotate. So when we do these operations to generate these synth synthetic labeled data points, uh, our idea is to suppress uh, specific features uh, which 
to not uh, contribute uh, significantly uh, to the labeling of, of, the, of the observations. When we do flipping, rotation, uh, and so on, our main objective is uh, to, to be able to recognize the invariances and uh, be uh, uh, to, to extract the, the invariances uh, in terms of features in order to, to, to provide a proper classification. And uh, we can also introduce some noise. So basically, uh, we do not expect, as we are going to see further in this presentation, uh, as, uh, a small amount of noise should not, uh, in, a, in, a, in a strong model, should not uh, confound uh, the, the output. So when we think in, in, in data uh, augmentation, uh, we, we, we are, uh, focusing on, on these main objectives, right? So if we think of a time series, which is a 1D uh, uh, classification of forecasting problem, for example, we can introduce some noise in, in the wave. So if we are thinking about an ECG classification, uh, when we impose some noise, uh, we would like to our algorithm be able to perform the proper classification uh, despite of the noise, right? Uh, then uh, the author uh, begins and develops the, the idea of transfer learning. So basically in this setting, uh, as he points out, many data poor tax, tasks have some high level structural similarity to other data rich tax, tasks. And for example, consider the task of fine grained uh, visual classification of endangered bird species, which is uh, a, a very interesting example in this setting. Given that endangered birds are by definition rare, it's unlikely that a large quantity of diverse labeled images of these birds exist. So, uh, however, a birds uh, bear many structural similarities across the species. For example, most birds have wings, feathers, beaks, claws, etc. And we therefore might expect that this, this fir that first training a model on a large data set of no non-endangered bird spe species and then continue to train it out on a small data set of endangered species could produce better results performing than training on a small data set alone. So basically uh, in, in, in this example, the author uh, established uh, what uh, might be a reasonable example of uh, a problem where transfer learning is applied, right? Uh, so in, in in, 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 in this setting, we first perform a pre-training phase in which we train a model with parameters theta on a large source data set DP. Uh, and this may be labeled and unlabeled. And, and then we perform a second fine tuning phase on this small labeled da uh, target data set called DQ of interest. And the final output layer uh, is trained from scratch uh, since it might correspond to a different label set. Uh, so basically the other layers are initialized at their previous parameters and then optionally updated using a small learning rate. Uh, so the idea here is kind of perform a model surgery as the, the the author points out and this model of surgery uh, is further more complex when we start to think of adapters, which is the next subtopic. So basically, first we, we train, uh, we pre-train uh, the model on this uh, larger data set. And then the intermediate layers, we copy them and fine tune, fine -tune them 
using uh, a small learning rate and we, we change the output layer for uh, the, the specific task of our interest in this case, for example, in the, in, in the birds setting uh, would be the endangered uh, species, right? Uh, so basically, as, as I said before in the previous slide, uh, what, uh, we can think of adapters as a, a, a more complex surgery. And this, uh, the adapters uh, rise in order to fix one of the disadvantages of fine tuning all the model parameters of a pre trained model. Uh, that is, uh, it, it can be very slow since there are often many parameters and we may need to, to use a small learning rate to prevent the, the low level feature structures from diverging too far from their prior values. So instead of doing uh, this complementary training, we actually copy them and do not uh, change their structures. So uh, if you're not going to change the structure, you have to develop an alternative approach, which is to keep uh, the pre-training model untouched, but to add new parameters to modify its internal behavior uh, to customize the feature extraction process for uh, the new task. So this, is, this idea is called adapters and has been explored in several papers. Uh, and, and these papers, according to, to the reference code that, uh, adopted in the book, uh, the, the author mentions the, these papers, right? So basically the pre-training task uh, here, this, the, the, the other top cohort, uh, in the transfer learning setting, uh, the pre-training task may be supervised or unsupervised, right? And the main requirements are that it can teach the model basic structure about the problem domain and that it's sufficiently similar to the downstream finding, finding turning task. So the notion of task similarity uh, is not rigorous, rigorously defined uh, which is a drawback, but in practice, the domain of the pre-training task is, is often more broad uh, than, the, uh, than, not, than that of the finding turning task. So uh, as uh, coming back to the, to the example that the author gave us in the, in the beginning of this uh, subtopic within the chapter, uh, in this case, pre-training on all bird species, which is more broad, uh, and then fine tune on the endangered species, right? And basically, as uh, we can see, this uh, uh, this graphic I, I have taken from a novel business process prediction model paper using a deep learning method approach. So basically, not all not all the the graphics uh, I have uh, extracted from the book. Right, uh, so all the graphics here have their own reference, okay? But the majority of the graphics I, I have extracted from the book. Uh, so for example, here we have uh, an unsupervised pred training with stacked out encoders, uh, which of course uh, is unsupervised. And the idea here is to, to, to extract the, the the, the latent feature at uh, the latent features and the supervised fine tuning, for example, with logistic regression. So the idea here is to use, uh, as we said before, uh, the intermediate layers and discard the, 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 the final layer in order to, 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 to copy and uh, reconstruct the, 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 this, these extracted features in a new setting. So when we go uh, deeper 
uh, in in the pre training in terms of supervised learning uh, the supervised pre training uh, is somewhat less common in non vision applications and one notable exception is to pre train on, on natural language interest data uh, which is for example whether a sentence imply or contradicts another to learn vector representations of sentences. Uh, though this approach has largely been supplanted or supplanted by unsupervised methods. Uh, another non-visual application of transfer learning is to pretend uh, speech recognition on a large English labeled corpus before finally turning on low resource languages. So when we think uh, on pre-training as we, we can see uh, in, in this in this image in this figure, for example, if we we think of the ImageNet dataset, uh, we we train the the the, the convolutional neural network uh, in order to classify if it's a dog, a horse, a sheep, a, a truck, or cat. And for example, if we go through a new dataset. Uh, about uh, tumoral cells, uh, we can uh, transfer uh, part of the convolutional filters uh, and layers for, for this new uh, data set and uh, just train uh, the, the top uh, layers in order to do specific tasks such as uh, detect uh, if the serial cells or lymphocytes, adenocarcinoma, eosinophilar, macrophage, meso mesothelial, etc. Uh, afterwards, uh, the author begins uh, presenting what is uh, self supervised in this case. Uh, unsupervised pre train And as he states, uh, it's increasingly common to use unsupervised pre training because unlabeled data is often easy to acquire. Uh, for example, unlabeled images or text documents from the web. And for a short period of time, it was common to pre train deep neural networks using an unsupervised objective such as uh, rec reconstruction error, as discussed in the section uh, 20.3 of the book, uh, over the label data sets, ignoring the labels before proceeding with standard supervised training. While this technique is also called unsupervised retraining, it differs from the form of retraining for transfer learning we discussed this section, which uses a large and labeled data set for pre-training before finally turning on a different, smaller labeled data set. Uh, and it's also important to state that pre-training tasks that use unlabeled data are often called self-supervised rather than unsupervised. Uh, this term is used because labels are created by the algorithm rather than being provided externally by a human as in standard uh, supervised learning. So both uh, supervised and self-supervised learning are discriminative tasks since they require in predicting outputs given inputs. By contrast, by contrast, other unsupervised approaches such as some of those discussed in chapter 20 are generative since they predict outputs unconditionally. So, when we think of self-supervised or unsupervised training, uh, we can divide uh, these techniques uh, into those based on imputation tasks, proxy tasks, contrastive tasks, and domain adaptation, okay? So in terms of imputation tasks, basically the main idea here is to divide the input factor into two parts, uh, xh and xv, right? 
So XH is the hidden part uh, of, of X, which we will, we will omit uh, during the, this, this training, this pre-training. And uh, we will try to develop a model where we uh, will be able to predict uh, this hidden part given only the visible part, which is XV. So we can think of this as a uh, fill in the blank task. Uh, in the NLP community, this is called close task. So for example, here uh, in, in, in this example from the book, uh, we remove a part of the picture, pass through uh, an encoder, we encode the features uh, channel wisely, uh, uh, into a fully connected uh, way to the uh, to the decoder, and then we try to reconstruct uh, the hidden part which was not given uh, for the algorithm. Uh, if we think of, for example, a time series or an LP problem, which is a, 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 a sequential problem we could predict any part of the input from any other part. So uh, here the idea would be predict the future from the past or the future from the recent past or predict the past from the present or predict the top from the bottom. So basically we try to predict the occluded uh, from the visible, right? In terms of proxy tasks, uh, which are also called pretext tasks. Basically, first we create pairs of inputs, right? And then we try to train uh, Zymes network classifier uh, of this form, right? P of YJ given X1 and X2, uh, where effects here. Uh, is some function that pre performs representation learning, and Y is some label that captures the relationship between X1 and X2, which is predicted by R of X1 and F X2. So for example, uh, suppose X1 is an image patch and X2 uh, equals to T X1, T X1, we can, think of some transformation of X1 that we control, such as, for example, a random rotation, then, then we define Y to be the rotation angle that we use it, for example. And then uh, we try to, uh, in this case, or minimize the distance or maximize the distance. So for example, if we have similar image, uh, our objective here, when we think of the setting is to uh, detect that these two images with uh, a small distortion or small transformation or similar images. Uh, in the case here, in, in the right side of the figure, uh, we, we want to maximize the distance because basically this image of eight is different from the four. Right, so uh, here uh, it, it's very interesting because actually, at least on my point of view, it seems uh, we are combining a way of uh, implement uh, the data augmentation, a kind of data augmentation that we have discussed here, right? In, in terms of transformation that we control. Uh, then uh, we have uh, SIM CLR, which stands for Simple Constructive Learning of Visual Representations here. Uh, in terms of contrastive tasks, uh, he, he also presents CLIP, but as there is a wide uh, range of topics, and this chapter is especially is very, very dense, for now, I, I have only focused on seeing CLR. I, I have skipped the, 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 the clip approach since 
it, it would be a, a, a different technique within the subtopic of contrastive tasks, right? So basically the, the idea of simple contrastive learning for uh, of visual representations for each input X uh, pertaining to our D is, co is to convert to augmented views X1 equals to T1 of X and X2 T2 of X, which are semantically equivalent versions of the input generated by some transformation T1 and T2. And, and this transformation more or less in the same way that we have just discussed in the previous slide. And for example, if X is an image, this could be small perturbation to the image, such as random crops. Uh, in addition to that, we sample uh, negative uh, examples of, uh, of the observations X1 to Xn from the data set, which represent semantically different images. So in practice, uh, all other examples in, uh, present in the mean batch. And next, we define some feature mapping F uh, that maps R in D to R in E, uh, where D is the size of the input, E is the size of the embedding. And we try to maximize the similarity of these views, of the similar views, while minimizing the similarity of different views for each input X, according to, to this expression. So basically, uh, this, this is very interesting in the way the author presents in, in terms of this schematic. Uh, if we think of, uh, of uh, CNN combined with uh, uh, ML, MLP architecture, and we think of a dog, the first step and, and a chair image. So the first step is to do the, the data augmentation. So basically, uh, we can cut a piece of the image where uh, we resize the, the, the dog's head and the, the dog's lower legs. And we change some of the colors. We decolorize or we recolorize this image or change the colors. The same for the chair. So a red chair, uh, we, we decolorize the image in, in the other uh, augmentation. Uh, we, we, we cut and resize uh, a, a, a piece of that image focusing on, 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 on the lower part of the chair. And then our main object, objective here, for example, when we are thinking of a dog uh, is to uh, find a representation where we are able to uh, attract uh, the different parts of the dog in order to uh, be able to rec recognize the features that better describes a dog and the same way a chair. On the other hand, uh, during this, uh, this training, our other uh, part of the, the objective function is to repel uh, the features of a dog in comparison to the features of a chair. So we expect that the lower leg, lower legs of a dog will help to describe what not uh, describes uh, a chair, for example, or the head of the dog has nothing to do with a chair. So uh, this is why we have this dual uh, objective here. Uh, the other subtopic presented in, in terms of the self-supervised learning was the domain adaptation. So as the author states, uh, we should consider a problem uh, in which we have inputs from different domains, such as a source domain, namely XS, 
and a target domain xt, but a common set of output labels y. This is uh, what we what he calls the the dual tr uh, of transfer learning, since the out uh, since the input domains are different, but the output domains are the same. So, for example. Uh, the domains might be images from a computer graphics system and real images or product reviews and movie reviews. So we assume we do not have labeled examples from, from the target domain. And our goal is to fit the model on the source domain and then modify its parameters so it works on the target domain. And this is what he calls uh, unsupervised domain adaptation. So uh, basically, let dn pertaining uh, to S and T uh, be a label that specifies if the data example n comes from domain S or T, source or target. And we want to op optimize uh, this loss function, uh, where basically we should focus here uh, in the fact that F maps the union of X, S, and X, T to uh, a, a kind of meta domain, uh, which here we, we can call H and uh, capital H, and G maps H into Y, T, which is our output, our common output. And the objective in the equation above is to minimize the loss on the desired task of training, of classifying Y, but also maximize the loss on the auxiliary task of classifying the source domain D. And this basically can be implemented by the gradient sign reversal tree. And this related to, to Gantt, uh, general adversarial networks. So if we uh, think of uh, the terms here in this expression, uh, in the left part here, uh, when we maximize this part of the loss function, the idea here is to abstract the source in a way they become indistinguishable to solve the problem. So, we, we maximize the, the, the loss function here. And the right part of, over here, the idea is to minimize loss, the loss function to solve the classification task uh, within a common set of output labels, rephrasing uh, what, we, uh, what, what I, I have just presented in the previous slide, right? So when we maximize this part of the loss function here in the left side of the expression, uh, the, the idea is to obtain a robust f of theta uh, that can map uh, in, in an indistinguishable way if your x is from the source or x from the target, xs or xt, right? So maximizing the loss function here, uh, maximizing the, the entropy here is to basically uh, tell to, to the algorithm uh, that basically uh, this, uh, uh, the origin is, uh, does not contribute for any additional information, right? And finally, we, we can uh, minimize the, the, the loss function for the, the classification task in a, in a robust way. Uh, the next topic covered in, the, in, in, this, uh, in this chapter is semi-supervised learning. So basically, in terms of semi-supervised learning, uh, we can think of uh, a way that can alleviate the, the need for labeled data by taking advantage of labeled data. So the general goal of semi-supervised learning 
is to allow the model to learn uh, the high level structure from the data distribution uh, present, uh, present on, on the unlabeled data and only rely on the labeled data for learning the fine grained details of a given task. Right. So, whereas in the standard supervised learning, we assume that we have access to samples from the joint distribution of data and labels X, Y uh, distributed accordingly to uh, a joint uh, distribution uh, P of X and Y, semi supervised learning assumes that we have additionally access to samples from the marginal distribution of facts as illustrated here in, in, in this figure, right? So uh, the, the, this figure tries to illustrate the benefits of semi-supervised learning for a binary classification problem. So if we think about the, the maximum margin, if we think of, for example, uh, an SVM decision boundary, we might learn uh, would be this one in the day part of the figure. But if we take into account the, the, the clustering, for example, of the, of the data points, which are extracted accordingly to the marginal distribution of facts, uh, our decision boundary might change uh, a lot in this case. So it's generally assumed that we have many of many more of these unlabeled samples since they are typically cheaper to obtain. And continuing the example of automatic speech recognition that the author gives in the in this chapter. It's often much cheaper to simply record people talking, which would produce labeled data, than it is to transcribe uh, recorded speech. So in this context, some supervised learning is a good fit for the scenario where we, we have a large amount of labeled data, uh, which has been collected and the practitioner would like to avoid having to label to label all of it. Uh, in this setting, this problem setting, the author uh, divides this topic into the following subtopics, self-training, entropy minimization, input-output input mutual information maximization, co-training, lab, label propagation, consistency regularization, and deep generative models. In terms of uh, semi-supervised learning, uh, and the, the first subtopic, self-training and pseudo-labeling, uh, this scheme I, 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 I have found at, uh, at, this, uh, at this blog, at this website, this, this the authorship of this is not mine, but I, I found uh, this way very uh, synthetic to, to, to bring to this explanation. It's basically, uh, we train uh, uh, a supervised mod model using labeled data. Afterwards, we make predictions on labeled data using the model from the previous step. So here we use the unlabeled data. Take the prediction satisfying probability thresholds or K-best criteria and add them to the pseudo-labeled data set, what we call here in, in this uh, diagram pseudo-labeled data. Then we combine the labeled and pseudo-labeled data and train the next version of the model. And then we make predictions on the remaining labeled data using this model. 
And again, we take prediction satisfying probability threshold or KBAS criteria and added them to the, to the existing uh, pseudo labeled set. So, in a kind of loop which is actually uh, lacking here in, in this uh, in, in this diagram, this flow. Once again, we we combine the labeled and pseudo labeled data and repeat the above above process until all the data has been labeled. No additional observations satisfy the criteria, or max number of iterations has been reached. And finally, as the final step, we evaluate the final model on test data. Okay. Uh, one of the main drawbacks of self-training is the fact that they can suffer from an obvious problem. If the model generates incorrect predictions for unlabeled data and then is retrained on these incorrect predictions, it can become progressively worse and worse at the, intending, at the intended classification task until it eventually learns a totally invalid solution. So this is basically the issue, the issue of uh, confirmation bias because the model is continually confirming it's all incorrect bias about the decision rule. So uh, a common metric, a, com a common way to mitigate this confirmation bias is to use a selection metric which heuristically tries to only retain pseudo labels that are correct, which is treated here in, in this diagram flow. In, in this case, uh, the, or the author of this, the original author of this diagram flow states to, to take prediction satisfying probability thresholds, which Murphy here, uh, uh, assumes uh, uh, as, a, as a possible solution for this issue or uh, KBEST criteria. Okay. So basically the idea here is to retain only pseudo labels whose lar largest, star largest class probability is above a threshold. Uh, another complementary part uh, of this subtopic uh, within this chapter is that uh, the author uh, establishes uh, two different strategies uh, for uh, self-training and pseudo labeling. Uh, in the first strategy, uh, pseudo labels are first predicted for the entire collection of unlabeled data, and the model is retrained possibly from scratch to convergence on the combination of labeled and pseudo-labeled pseudo -labeled or unlabeled data. And then the unlabeled data is relabeled by the model and the process repeats itself un until a, a, a suitable solution is found. Or the second strategy, which continually generates predictions on randomly chosen batches of unlabeled data and immediately trains the model against these Sell the labels. Okay. Uh, the other subtopic as a possible strategy within the semi supervised learning framework uh, is the entropy minimization. And it is very interesting uh, the, the, the way that the author points out that the fact that self training as we saw in the previous slides, has the implicit effect of encouraging the model to output low entropy. In other words, high confidence predictions. Uh, this effect uh, is most ap apparent uh, in the online setting with a cross entropy loss where the model minimizes the following loss function L on labeled data which is given by this expression, Ma uh, maximize the argument C of log of P of theta of Y equals to C conditioned to X, given X. So basically uh, P theta of Y given X 
is the model's class probability distribution given input x. And this function is minimized when the model assigns all of its class probability c star, in other words, p uh, of y equals to c, give, c star given x equals to one and p uh, of y different of c star given x equals to zero. Uh, it's also interesting to, to observe that uh, there is a, 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 a close related, which is uh, uh, a close related technique, which is the, the, the entropy minimization. Uh, in this case, we minimize uh, P of theta Y equals to C given X times the, the log of the theta y equals to c given x. So, so basically we, we are minimizing the, the entropy. Let's remember this is the, the definition of entropy. Uh, and basically uh, this function is also minimized when the model assigns all of its class probability to a single class. Okay. Which is, we, we can, better realize this assertion given this term in the expression, right? Uh, the other subtopic discussed here uh, is the cluster assumption. So the author starting to, to discuss uh, whether or why is entropy minimization a good idea? So basically, uh, this assumption of uh, the, the basic assumption of many semi supervised learning methods is that the decision boundary between classes should fall in a low density region, region of the, uh, the data manifold. So this effectively assumes that the data corresponding to different classes are clustered together. And the fact that also a good decision boundary, therefore, should not pass through clusters. It should simply separate them, right? And this can be better seen in this, in this figure below. So for example, for this data point, taking into account the, the cluster, it makes more sense this decision boundary other than this decision boundary, because this uh, boundary is cutting, uh, this passing uh, right in the middle of a cluster, right? So it's not taking into consideration possibly uh, other aspects of the, of, of, of the input variable, right? Uh, in the this also in the same supervised learning setting, uh, the 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 author presents the input and output mutual information maximization. And here, without going uh, deep into the mathematical development of uh, of this idea, but trying to explain very briefly. Uh, the, the objective of, of, of this mathematical development is to, to apply what we call the, the trick of using a derived at loss function from mutual information criterion, right? So, so basically we can uh, rewrite the, the mutual information criterion from this expression into this expression in terms of, uh, of entropy. Uh, and then we use this new loss function. When, when we use this new loss function here, this final expression that I, uh, uh, I have highlighted here in this uh, last square over here, uh, when we use this new loss function implicitly, we are maximizing the mutual information between input and output. Hence, 
if clusters, for example, are present in the input, outputs should take into that account. Okay, so th this is the, the main idea when we uh, derive a loss function in terms of the mutual information criterion instead of just maximizing uh, uh, another object or minimizing another objective, traditional objective. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the other, uh, another subtopic presented by the author, which is co-training. And co-training is also similar to self-training, but makes an additional assumption that there are two complementary views, uh, in other words, independent sets of features of the data, both of which can be separately used to train a reasonable model. And after training these two models separately on each view, unlabeled data is classified by each model to obtain uh, candidate pseudo labels. If a particular pseudo label uh, receives a low entropy prediction indicating a high confidence from one model, and a high entropy prediction indicating low confidence from the other, then that pseudo label data point is added to the training set for the low confidence model. Then the process is repeated and repeated again with new enlarging training data sets. And the procedure of only retaining pseudo labels when only one of the models is confident easily builds up on the, in the, the training sets with correctly labeled data. So uh, here, uh, what we can highlight uh, is the co-training makes the strong assumption that there are two informative but independent views of data, which may be not true for many problems. And as an al alternative to try to circumvent this problem is the try training algorithm, uh, which circumvents the issue by instead using three models that are first trained on independently sample with replacement subsets of the labeled data, and ideally initially training on different collections of labeled data uh, results in models that do not always agree on their predictions. Then the other topic covered uh, uh, in, in the, the subtopic covered in, in this section of the chapter is label propagation. So ideally, if two data points are similar in some meaningful way, uh, we might expect that they share a label, okay? So this idea has been referred to manifold assumption. So label, Propagation is a semi-supervised learning technique that leverages the, the manifold assumptions to assign labels to unlabeled data. And label propagation first constructs a graph where nodes are the data examples and the way and edge weights represent the degree of similarity. So the node labels are known for nodes corresponding to labeled data, but are unknown for labeled data and label propagation then propagates the non-label non-labels across edges of the graph in a such a way that there is minimal disagreement in the labels of a graph given nodes neighbors and this the, the idea is that this provides label guesses for the unlabeled data which can be then used in the usual way for supervised training of a model so basically if we have uh, a graph over here in this figure uh, consisting of two only known uh, data points, how can we infer uh, the nature of uh, these unknown labels across edges and how can we propagate them? So uh, in order to to have any success on this propagation, we depend heavily on the notion of similarity used to construct the weights between different nodes. So for simple data, measuring the Euclidean distance between data points can, can be sufficient. However, 
for complex and high dimensional data, uh, the Euclidean distance might not meaningfully reflect the, the likelihood that two data points share the same class. Uh, so the similarity weights can also be set arbitrarily according to the problem specific knowledge. So if we try to go deeper on, on the algorithm, uh, if we have n labeled data points and n unlabeled data points with m plus n times m plus n uh, matrix T, transition matrix T given by uh, weight uh, W, Y, and J, index Y and J, I throw J column. Uh, this uh, transition, transition matrix is uh, usually uh, normalized to, to one. So, so we divide uh, the, the we, re, we rescale uh, all the weights by the kth row, right? Uh, and hence, uh, TYJ uh, represents the probability of propagating the, the label for node J to node I. Further, uh, we can define uh, M plus N times C label matrix Y, where C is the number of possible classes. Then the ith row of Y represents the class probability distribution for the data point I. So the basic idea of the algorithm is to repeat the following steps until the values of Y do not change significantly. Uh, here, I, I took the freedom to use prime and double prime symbols to distinguish the steps. So within a loop, we have basically four steps here. So first, uh, we use the transition matrix T to propagate the levels, the, the labels, the labels in, in Y by setting T times Y equals to Y prime. So here we, we, we have Y prime. Then we renormalize the rows of Y prime by setting uh, Y double prime uh, in the ith row C column equals to Y prime divided by the sum of uh, in the K row of uh, the terms of Y I K prime. And finally, we replace the rows Y double prime corresponding to the label data points with their one hot representation. Uh, in other words, uh, Y prime uh, in the ith row C column equals to one if data point Y I uh, has ground truth label C and zero otherwise. In the end of the loop, uh, we set for the next transition y equals to y double prime. So then we can repeat. Okay. This is uh, uh, a minor issue that I found uh, in, in the algorithm description in the book, which uh, abuses of the, of, of the notation y. So that's why I took the freedom to, to, to adapt here. And out of the loop after convergence, uh, guess at labels are chosen based on the highest class probability for each data point in Y. Okay. Uh, later, uh, consistency regularization is presented. So what is consistency regularization? Consistency regularization, the main idea here is to leverage uh, the simple idea that perturbing a given data point or the model itself should not cause uh, the model's output to change dramatically. Uh, basically, uh, when we measure consistency in this way, uh, we only make use of the model's output and not the ground truth labels. And it's readily applicable to unlabeled data and therefore can be used to create appropriate loss functions for semi-supervised learning. And as also the author states, 
uh, this idea was first proposed under the framework of learning with pseudo ensembles with similar variants following soon thereafter. So a common simple form of consistency regularization first samples uh, X prime uh, distributed by key of X prime given X, where key X prime given X is the distribution induced by the stochastic input, input transformation, and then minimize the loss uh, function, uh, the L2 norm of uh, P theta Y given X minus P theta of Y given X prime. So basically here, the idea trying to translate into simple, simpler terms is that uh, when we create uh, dis disturbed, perturbed versions of X, in this case, X prime, uh, we, we, sh we, should, we, should, we shall not have uh, uh, a, a meaningful distance between uh, the original distribution and this new distribution, right? So that's why uh, we we regularize we regularize the, the problem in terms of consistency. Uh, in practice, this the first term of this expression p theta of y given x j is typically treated as fixed. Uh, in other words, gradients are not propagated through it. Uh, and in the semi-supervised setting, the combined loss function over a batch of labeled data, x1, y1, x2, y2, and so on until xm, ym, and unlabeled data uh, is uh, given by this expression. Uh, so basically, uh, we have expression where we have uh, a right side of, uh, of the expression uh, multiplied by a lambda scalar, which is a hyperparameter that balances the importance of the loss on the Leila data. And uh, for simplicity, we, we write xj, uh, x prime j to denote a sample drawn from key uh, x prime given xj. Okay. So basically, we try to, to, to minimize the, the original traditional loss function, uh, but including a, an additional weight for uh, the importance of the consistency of uh, synthetic perturbation on, on the data sets, which is how I I paint it over here in, in, in this expression. Finally, uh, in the in the semi-supervised learning in terms of deep generative models, the author uh, divides this subtopic into four new topics, which he treats uh, variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, normalizing flows, and combining self and semi-supervised learning. In, in, in terms of uh, VAEs, uh, this, this is basically typically done by, and indeed it's shown that the latent variables can be used to train stronger models when labels are scarce. In this case, unsupervised learning of representations obtained by the latent vector here can help in the spirit of self-supervised learning shown earlier on this presentation to achieve better results in the final supervised task with scarce labels. So here, uh, the idea when we use uh, VAEs is to 
in, in the original sense of self supervised. Uh, um, Fernando? Was, okay. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to give you a heads up that we have about 15 minutes left, um, and you're welcome to go till the end. Um, I just didn't want it to suddenly, the, the meeting will end in 15 minutes. So just, okay. just so you just so you know. <laughs> um, okay. So we, okay. So uh, you know, that way you won't just suddenly get cut off. <laughs> oh, of course. I, I, I'll try to speed up because this, this, this yeah. was a huge, huge, huge chapter. You, and you're doing an, an excellent job. And the material, is, your slides are really fantastic. So thank you. Okay. So, so yeah, go, go on. Go. Okay, so so here the, the idea is to to use this Latin factor representation the, in the same sense that we have uh, presented uh, earlier uh, as a way of using them uh, in the same in the, in the same sense as the pre training and change the output layer to 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 our final task right. Uh, in the in this in the GAN setting, and and here uh, uh, here given this warning, I, I'm I'm going to speed up a little bit, and uh, as I will provide this material, feel free uh, later to 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 check all the 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 details. Here, uh, as with the standard GAN training, here we 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 still have the generator and discriminator structure. Uh, and uh, basically, we modify the critics so the outputs, uh, or, or we, we basically use uh, the, the, the class labels and we add a, a fake uh, in, instead of simply classifying real versus fake. Uh, so for label data, this the critic is trained to output the appropriate class label and for unlabeled data it is trained to raise the probability of any uh, of the class labels uh, so th this is the main spirit of of, of GANs. Uh, and when we think of normalizing flows this was uh, very challenging because this topic is covered only in the other next book of Kevin Murphy, which is the advanced the probabilistic machine learning uh, advanced topics, right? So basically the idea of normalizing flow uh, is uh, to sample uh, the, the, the distribution using an invertible function, an invertible mapping. And uh, usually, we, we start from uh, a very simple base distribution and then we train uh, uh, an invertible map. So here we have, for example, a base distribution, a normal base distribution. And the basic idea here of a, a, a 30 second crash course on <laughs> normalizing flow is if one can use flexible invertible transformation F whose Jacobian determinant can be computed efficiently, that's why we sample from simple base distribution, then one can construct complex densities P of X that allow exact sampling and efficient exactly, exact likelihood computation. So this in contrast to latent variable models as the previous ones, which required methods like variational inference to lower bounds, uh, lower bound uh, the, the, the likelihood, uh, we can uh, simply, in a flexible way, sample uh, from complex distribution and approximate any smooth distribution. That's the, the main idea of normalizing flow. Okay, and then if if we can do this operation, uh, sample from a, a very complex distribution. Actually, finally, uh, we can apply it for the, the same supervised setting, uh, which we can maximize the joint uh, likelihood of labeled DOL and labeled data TU uh, over the parameter theta of the objective function F, which learns a density model for 
a Bayes classifier. Okay. So uh, in to, to to close this this topic, the author has also presented uh, a way to combine self-supervised and semi-supervised learning, which this kind of demand, I think, uh, became pretty much straightforward when we uh, have treated uh, the, 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 these previous subtopics. Uh, the, the, the most prominent one is scan and normalizing flow, right? So we, we train labeled data and from the projectum head, uh, we use uh, them to, to, to make a supervised fine tuning using a small fraction of data that has class labels. And then we, we do the, the, the final knowledge distillation, right? Using self-training, okay? Uh, the other topic is active learning. So the goal is to identify the true predictive mapping y equals to f of x by querying to the expert as few x and y points as possible, especially when we have very few labeled data. So the author, author uh, states that there are three main variants in query synthesis, the algorithm gets to choose any input x and can ask for its corresponding output y of uh, y equals to f of x. In pool-based active learning, there is a large but fixed set of labeled data points and the algorithm gets to ask for a label for one or more of these points. And in stream-based active learning, the income data, incoming data is arriving continuously and the algorithm must choose whether it wants to request a label for the current input or not. And here the focus of the book is on query synthesis. Uh, within query synthesis, uh, he divides this approach into three uh, different settings, decision theoretic approach, information theoretic approach, and batch, if, batch active learning. Uh, in the deci decision theoretic approach, uh, we define the utility, the utility function of querying X in terms of the value of the information, uh, which is given by this expression. So basically, uh, R of A, which is an action given D is the is the posterior expected loss of taking some future action A given the data D observed so far. Uh, and how we use this approach, uh, how catastrophic would be for my outcome not reasoning a new data point. So for example, if you are a, a physician, uh, whether should I call an expert to assess an athlete ECG versus calling an expert to assess uh, a 81 year old man ECG, for example. Probably it would be more catastrophic if you're not uh, an ECG reader, uh, if, if you do not call an expert to assess the 80, 81 years old man ECG rather than the athlete ECG. So when we establish the, the, the utility uh, of the, the future action. Given the data, uh, we, we, we can express this in, in term, with the risk of, of being wrong in terms of the value of the information. Uh, in the infor information theoretic approach, uh, we avoid using task specific loss functions and instead we focus on learning our model as well as we can. So in the information theoretic approach, we define the utility of querying X in terms of information gain about the parameters theta as a reduction in the entropy. So uh, this part of this expression uh, defines how much ignorant 
uh, we are in terms of the uncertainty associated with theta given d and the red part of the expression, the uncertainty removed when more y's are revealed. So for example, in a very simple statement, imagine that we have five blues and five green points. So basically before uh, dividing this, this, this data set, before establishing a decision boundary, uh, the entropy of this whole data set is equal to one, right? If we just uh, apply the, 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 the entropy formula. And afterwards, when we establish uh, a simple decision boundary where the left branch has four blues and uh, the, the, the right plane branch has one blue and five greens, the entropy becomes the, of this part uh, 0.65. So left, we have the entropy zero because uh, we have all blue. So uh, basically there is no uh, further information that can be structured according to only these data points. So the average of the, the, the entropy here is 0.39, which is weighted in terms of how many poles we have in each branch. And then uh, the information gained uh, as a consequence of establishing this uh, decision boundary is 0.61. This is, this is the, the idea because we reduce the entropy from one to uh, 0.39. And uh, according to this formula, uh, the, the, the main catch up of using this approach, what would be my information gain if we query a blue point over here, given this current model? Or what would be my information gain if we uh, query a green point over here, or a blue point over here and a green point over here? this information gains would be totally different, right? Finally, uh, we have batch active learning. So, so far we have assumed that greedy or myopic strategy, which uh, we select a symbol at sample X and as if it were the last data points to be selected, but sometimes we have a budget to collect a, a set of B samples, call them uh, capital X, at the Y. And in this case, the information gain criterion becomes proportional uh, to the whole, to, to these whole vectors. Uh, and it's very interesting uh, to, to see that under certain conditions, the greedy strategy is near optimal, as we now explain. Uh, one part of uh, that, that the author states, it, and it's also very interesting, is that uh, originally, if we discard uh, all possible conditions, including these certain conditions, this is uh, an NP hard problem in terms of calculating the information gain. Okay, so basically, if we know that any given next information gain function uh, becomes the same, but it still maps Y to a scalar, and it's clear that F of uh, em empty set equals to zero and f is uh, a non-decreasing function, uh, meaning that uh, 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 a large set of y, uh, the f value of, of a large set of y is uh, larger or at least equal to uh, a smaller set of y due to the fact that more information never hurts principle. So, in this paper, the authors proved that F is submodular, and as a consequence, as a consequence, sequential greedy approaches within a constant factor of optimal. Uh, finally, I think I I won't have enough time to present, but it it it, uh, it comes the the meta learning, which basically 
is an algorithm that can be thought as a function A that maps theta to a parameter estimate theta equals to A of D, D is, the, is the theta. So- Okay, um, we're gonna have to stop, unfortunately. Um, okay. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Please send me your slides um, so that I can post them and share them. Um, and, sure. and once again, thank you very much. That was an amazing um, presentation. Um, folks, I'm sorry that we don't have time for questions, but we'll meet back here um, next week. Okay, thanks again. Okay. Good night.